All right, I think we can get started here. So uh, my name is Ron. I'm on the marketing team here at Endor Labs. And uh, with me is uh, Matt. Matt, you used to be a developer, right, before you sold out? Long time ago, for a short amount of time, too. I hated fixing vulnerabilities, so I decided I'm out of here. Decided to, to make it your business. <laughs> That's right. Um, so for those of you who have attended RSA, I hope that you have uh, recovered. And uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, I'm jealous. But um, let's uh, let's uh, get started. So we talk a lot about software supply chain security and uh, what it actually means. I think software supply chain security is one of those terms that you ask five different people at a show like RSA, what is software supply chain security to them? Um, then you'll get five completely different answers. So I think it's important for this discussion to kind of level set a little bit on how do we see software supply chain security uh, and how do we see the concept of uh, software dependencies and uh, securing those software dependencies? So we see a few major components, and this roughly aligns with uh, the way that uh, something like Salsa or Gartner uh, typically look at it. But we look at the software supply chain uh, security process as three major factors. Um, how do you curate and evaluate everything that goes into your software? Specifically, we're talking about the... Uh, how 80% of code bases are open source. How do you decide what goes, what ingredients are going to go into your meal, essentially? So how do you evaluate and start clean with software that uh, goes into the applications that, um, that you're going to be building and shipping? Then how do you secure and prioritize risks that match the risk profile that your company cares about? And specifically, uh, how do you protect the artifacts that you're building? And I think here is really where we're going to get into an interesting definition of what is a software dependency, right? Because if you think about what Endor Labs is, Endor Labs is about securing everything your code depends on, from your open source dependencies to the pipeline themselves, to the artifacts that you ship, everything that your code and the shipping of your code depends on. Um, the security and prioritization of risks around that, that is what Android Labs is all about. And finally, how do you validate the integrity of your software artifacts through provenance? And this will have a lot to do also with, uh, with visibility and with uh, compliance. If we take a step back for a moment and try to think about the, the problem that we're trying to solve, which I think is, Matt, what you started talking about in your uh, software development days, is that protecting software has just become really, really hard. This is what we're hearing from our customers. And this is also what originally led uh, Varun and Dimitri, our co-founders, when they were running you know, a 400-person engineering team in Palo Alto Networks. What eventually drove them to start this company is that their developers were frustrated by security noise. That led to a culture of uh, being uh, dismissive of tools and risks when you drown your developers in a lot of false positives. Application security in general uh, seems more like a blocker, something that slows me down rather than helps me. Um, then we start missing our SLAs, our KPIs, and it becomes harder to fund the program then, right? It becomes then harder to get buy-in from executives um, into funding the program and actually protecting the software that you are chartered with protecting. And then it becomes this bit of a, of a vicious cycle. So addressing this issue is what Android Labs is all about. Android Labs is about securing everything your code depends on. And if you think about what is a software dependency, a software dependency is not just your open source code. That you are uh, that you depend on and your direct and transitive dependencies. It could also be your GitHub action. It could also be an LLM model. It can be a million different things that Matt is going to go into with uh, with more detail. But I think that is one of the most important um, kind of mindset shifts, like the perspective shifts that we need to talk about uh, when we talk about what does it mean to secure everything that your code depends on. The Ender Labs product or the uh, supply chain security platform is built out of um, uh, three main areas or three main uh, solution areas. One is securing your open source code, which includes how do you select better open source code matching the risk profile that uh, matches your company. 
and then using reachability based SEA to prioritize the security and legal risks that you specifically care about. And um, one thing that Ender Labs does is provide you a lot of context so you can get really accurate and uh, low noise results. I think the most significant context, the most differentiated context is reachability analysis. But um, beyond that, it can also be EPSS or it can be the risk profile for the individual packages that uh, that you're using. It really uh, is it can be different based on the policy that you want to define in your organization. That was our foundation. That's where we started securing open source code. But then as we thought about it more throughout the life cycle of, uh, of the company, um, we really did have that realization that everything is a dependency. So it's not enough to just secure that code that goes into your application, but also if you're building a car and securing open source code is um, making sure that, you know, the seat belts and seats and wheel and everything on the car is made from uh, the right materials. You also need to think about the security and access to the assembly line, the robots themselves that are putting the car together, which is more about securing the repositories themselves, CACD pipeline, and verifying um, artifact integrity with artifact signing. And then across all of that, there is, of course, a layer of uh, achieving compliance and visibility and reporting into SBOMs, which more executives are now having to attest to. Uh, we have a really great case study about that on uh, on the website. Um, I'm going to pause there, but I do want to quickly plug our latest uh, software supply chain security white paper. It's free on the website. Uh, you don't have to submit a form or anything. Uh, and it really breaks down all the different areas of software dependencies that deserve some level of attention from you uh, for security. Um, Matt, what do you think? Do you think uh, I missed anything or do you want to jump right in? No, yeah, you hit it right on the head. I can jump right in, but you're right. Like people usually think of a dependency as some from Maven, some from NPM. Um, it's not that anymore. You know, there's now all these things like typo squatting and name confusion. And, you know, if you think of GitHub Actions, what are GitHub Actions made out of? They're made out of NPM components, right? They're, they're their own projects, their own applications, they're just GitHub Actions. So it's no longer just, okay, I want to secure this component from NPM or I want to secure my app from these different components. It's anything your software depends on to run is what we want to help people secure and maintain. So that's that's the main goal of Endor. And I typically don't start on dashboards because dashboards are dashboards, right? And it's like, well, why do people want dashboards? Why do people like dashboards? And if we're being honest here, it's to show the higher ups, right? Hey, we're doing our work. We're saving money. We're saving time. Like this is the status of what we're doing and why we have this tool in the first place. And this is really what we want to show. And this really kind of tells the story of, especially with uh, Endor's open source offering is um, what can I actually take action on? Like what, what needs to be focused now? So what we wanted to do was show, okay, I got, you know, almost 500 total vulnerabilities, 420 of those aren't in test. I can fix 408 of them. That's typically where it like ends, right? That's typically where you say with the kind of legacy tools, okay, it's critical, fixable and exploitable. All right. Well, I really want to narrow it down more. So 310 of these are reachable, but only 20 are exploitable, like have an EPSS of over 1%, right? And you may be thinking, okay, well, this isn't how we do it. Well, you can tweak all these different numbers, right? So we give you the ability to say, okay, actually for us, it's anything over 5% is what we want to focus on. Well, then that narrows it down to eight. And on average, our developers spend eight hours, you know, some some vulnerabilities take two minutes to fix, some take two months to fix, right? But we want to start ones that aren't in test and, you know, you can do five, eight, whatever. And the hourly cost of a developer making, you know, 400000 or $400,000, $150,000, $180,000 a year, you can break it down to $40, $70, whatever you want. And it will actually update this whole chart for you to say, okay, we may have 500 open vulnerabilities, but we really only need to focus on eight of them. And these are the eight that we're going to focus on. It'll bring you to that. 
Um, but this is a new dashboard that we have that we're that we just released. We're going to be adding things like burn down charts, say here the last 30, 60, 90 uh, days of us remediating things to really show, okay, how are we improving our vulnerabilities? How are we actually fixing things? How are we doing, right? Why do we even have this tool? So now this 3000 hours can go back into innovating and, you know, beating the competition rather than spending time on fixing vulnerabilities that don't even really affect us. that don't need to be addressed right away kind of thing. And how that looks on a project level is we'll, we'll take a look at this Java application, right? And to be clear, we can do reachability for Java, Python, Go, Rust, um, .NET, C Sharp, at both the direct dependency and transit dependency level as well. Our database for these reachable vulnerabilities for these call graphs for the vulnerabilities that we can identify, that goes all the way back to about 2016. Um, and something like JavaScript, we can do dependency level reachability today, and whether it's direct or transitive, and then we'll also be able to do function level reachability soon for JavaScript as well. But if we actually take a look at a finding, Let's break it down into, and again, you see all these different kind of categories, not just vulnerabilities, but any other kind of issues you need to be aware of in order to say, hey, yes, this is a, um, a dependency, whether that be, you know, something with supply chain malware as well. We can do our own malware detection too. see it, something in CI, CD, but let's look at vulnerabilities first. And then we could say, okay, let's see the ones I can fix. The ones that are not test uh, test dependencies, we don't need those. And then a reachable function as well. And if we take a look at one here, you're going to see what you'd expect to find in an SCA tool, right? Your CVE, your EPSS, um, your CVSS, the path it comes in. Can I fix it? Is it, you know, how do I fix it? It's pretty standard stuff, right? Like it'd be weird if a tool didn't have this kind of information. And this is great, but if I'm making a ticket for somebody to fix, the next question is going to be, okay, show me, don't tell me. How do you know I'm actually using this? And this is where the call path comes in. How this works is we run a static analysis on your code. That's sole job is to generate a call graph of the, of the project, right? And the analysis takes place on your side. You don't send us your code. We don't want your code. We simply get back a call graph, dependency graphs, metadata, but your code stays on your side. And so now we have this call graph from the code. We then have all these call graphs from all these open source dependencies already in our database, again, that date back to 2016. So you can look at it like from here, this org Apache Commons text at 1.9, from here down, this is in our database already, we have this. So what we do is we take these two call graphs now, we do what's called stitching, we stitch them together. We say, okay, your project here, your application has this package with this method that you wrote that calls this component that then calls this method, this method that all the way down into where the vulnerability actually exists. So instead of starting out with those six findings that are vulnerabilities, we now narrow it down to two. And now when I'm making the ticket, we could say, okay, not only is this critical, it's fixable, it has an EPSS of this, it's this, it's that. Also, here's how it's being used. Like when I was a developer, we would get this probably like two months later because of all the work and research that would have to go into it. But when we got this, we would say, yeah, that's right, that's bad code. Of course we'll fix it. Like we don't want this in there either. It's when we got a list of like a thousand issues in a spreadsheet where we said, oh, forget it. Like I'm not even using half of these. I got to build, you know, I got to innovate. I got to push new features. I don't have time to fix all this stuff, but I will make time to fix a critical level vulnerability that I know I'm using. Like that's the real difference there. So for developers, it's also what the main benefit, if we're being honest, it's less Jira tickets. <laughs> that's really what it is. Um, that's SCA at the vulnerability level. And then of course, speaking of dependencies, we have repository information as well. Let me clear that out. So things like best practices or CIS benchmarks for something like GitHub, right? Hey, you don't have MFA required for external contributors or internal contributors. This needs to get adjusted. 
you, you know, there's unauthorized tool detection in here. There's a tool that's being used that we didn't buy, we didn't purchase. Why are you using it, right? Code owner approval. You should have that. These are all policies that are already baked in that you can tweak or adjust with how you want. And that brings us into the extra data surrounding these dependencies that we identify. So like I was mentioning before, it's not just, you know, vulnerabilities and license issues anymore for SCA, right? You hear these things like typo squatting, name confusion, uh, malware detection, single maintainership, all this other things, all these other things that aren't necessarily vulnerabilities or license issues, but could still introduce a lot of risk. And we break these down into four categories. Security, that's pretty obvious, right? Uh, does it have vulnerabilities in it? If so, how many? All that good stuff. Uh, security, activity, popularity, and quality. So like this component, for example, you know, for each one, we run about 150 different data points surrounding every dependency. So in this one, hey, in my environment, I'm using 2.7.1, that's 34 months old, 14 releases behind, I should take a look at that, right? There's no automated build system, high ratio of unmerged pull requests, all that really, really good stuff. But there's some good things here too, right? There's recent commit activity, there's com continuous commit activity. Like this is clearly an active project. There's recent issue activity. We give all the evidence supporting these different data points. Um, bot accounts, there's frequent releases. It's an organization repository, Google. I think we can trust that organization, hopefully. Whereas something like C3PO, no pun intended, you know, there's a lot of unfixed critical vulnerabilities. It's a single maintainer. There's no recent commit activity. It's super popular because it's everywhere, but this is clearly one that is going to introduce some risk. And one of the things our customers did was they wanted to find out, hey, what can we tell them about XZ, right? That whole XZ component that happened a few weeks ago or a month ago. And they set up a policy where they said, hey, find me the components that have a single maintainer that have a high ratio of unmerged pull requests and that, that store binaries in the repository and it popped right up. And that actually brings me into uh, policies as well. But I saw something pop up in the chat for questions. Does it continuously scan the repo for SCA issues? Uh, yes, it can continuously scan. What's nice here is you don't have to like rescan quote unquote, like a whole application. They give it as like a refresh, meaning every 24 hours we run a refresh of, Hey, is there anything new in these components, new findings, new risks, new vulnerabilities, whatever have you, and let's surface those to the user. So you don't have to like, it's not a whole rescan. So you're not using a ton of time or compute power. It's just, Hey, let's refresh the data, if you will, which is really nice. Makes everything much faster. With policies, there's a few different types of policies, but we'll talk about action and findings. So action policies are what you think they are. If you find this thing, do this, right? So what's key here is that let's do it for vulnerabilities. You know, when every build is broken, no builds are actually broken. And what would happen with me is, you know, there's always going to be vulnerabilities. Like it's like death taxes and vulnerabilities are the software is always going to have vulnerabilities. It's like the guarantees in life, right? When I see a broken build, my reaction shouldn't be, oh, let me sneak around it so that I can deploy into prod because like, it's just another broken build. It means nothing. It should be like, uh oh, you know, these, this doesn't usually happen. One of my builds should not get broken unless it's like a real problem. So I need to talk to somebody about this. I need to talk to security. It should be a, a real, like, I need to stop and think about this. So what we want to do is say, okay, anything with critical and high, fix available. Maybe we do direct dependency because those are way easier to fix than transitive ones, right? That's kind of typically where it ends with a lot of tools. But now I'm going to say, okay, only if it's these and the dependency is reachable and the function is reachable and we exclude test uh, dependencies and we do an EPSS probability threshold of anything above 5% and it's this source code ecosystem and you get the idea. It's super specific so that 
a build only fails when it's like a true, Hey, I got to stop what I'm doing here and address this. Anything else you could send a notification, you know, you can warn, you can send this to Jira, you can automate this whole thing. Right. But break the bill when it's truly, I really need to break that bill. That's action policies. The finding policies is where it gets fun. So really under the hood of Endor are these policies. And of course you have vulnerabilities. We have secrets. We can talk about that if we have some time, but you have all these other policies here. You know, the contributors should not approve their own code changes, all the ones that we've been taking a look at, license risks, outdated dependencies, unmaintained, all that really good stuff. But if you remember all those different data points, those 150 different data points we check, make a policy out of them. You can literally, quite literally, make a finding policy out of any of the data that we have in order for you to, you know, really get a handle on your open source. So these are some like from a template, right? Or require a certain tool, uh, valid secrets, restricted software license type. You can pick some if you have like an allow list of certain license types, right? Or you can make it completely from scratch using Rego and OPA. And what this allows you to do is take any of the data that we find and make a finding policy out of it. So if I wanted to make a finding policy, and this is actually what one of our customers did recently, they didn't want Django version 2.4 anywhere, right? They Because it's going to be end of life in a year, a year or two. So they made a policy saying, hey, find any version of Django 4.2 and let me know about it, but also prevent any introduction of Django 4.2 because I don't want it in there because it's going to be end of life. And then, of course, you can actually write instructions to the developer that sees this finding to say, hey, don't use this version. Use this version instead. That will allow you to actually go, up, go ahead and continue here. We've approved this version, so on and so forth. So... Again, you could do it for like malware, you could do it for single maintainership, you could do it for something like that XZ where you flag it. Hey, this is a single main maintainer uh, component. They store binaries in the repo. There's a lot of rejected pull requests, all that really, really good stuff there. Uh, let me do a quick time check. Got five minutes. Let's talk about artifacts real quick. So everybody talks about code to cloud. Right, code to cloud. What the heck does that actually mean? Okay. My viewpoint is I like to use math, not magic. So, what we're doing with artifacts, and again, this is the same tool command, endor CTL, that you put in your CI that you can sign these artifacts with. And you can kind of think of this as, you know, people like to use our artifact offering instead of let's say um, SigStore, because SigStore is public, like everybody can see SigStore. We have that option. You could build your own and maintain the, your own infrastructure and all of that, that's very difficult to do. It takes a long time. With ours, we maintain it, right? We sign everything, it's all signature based. And again, it's with the same tool. So you could sign any kind of artifact, right? You sign an image, sign an S-bomb, sign whatever you need. So the scenario here is that you can trace this throughout your entire SDLC. And the really big scenario, especially when it comes to code to cloud, is something like a Wiz or a Prisma says, hey, uh, this image, this container that's running in this Kubernetes cluster has this vulnerability. Okay, great. I can see that this was deployed the other day, whatever have you. Here's the vulnerabilities for it. Well, it has a signature from Endor Labs. And here's that signature from Endor. Now I could trace that all the way back throughout the SDLC, show where it's actually been deployed, how it's been deployed, who deployed it, the owner here, all of that really good stuff. And I could trace it back all the way to the image with which it's generated. And I can even trace it back to if it's an open source component that was done at the application layer that made its way into the container that alerted to, to that vulnerability as well. So again, with, with this artifact signing, it's math, it's not magic, it's math. Um, Is that, Matt, how yeah. you would like deduplicate an alert? Like if, if you- You see, could do that. If you yeah. see, a, does that solve for, I see a risk in my container scan and I see a risk in my 
SCA scan, yep. is it actually the, the same risk? You could, you could deduplicate that by tracing it all the way back into there because when like a kubernetes cluster it could be spinning up a bunch of different instances there that could all be alerting to the same thing with like auto scaling mm -hmm. so we could just trace it back to this one issue with this one signature with this one artifact to say okay this image is generating three thousand alerts but it's all part of the same image just trace it all the way back in front to the beginning where it was signed and then we'll be able to identify that as well so yeah i could totally totally do that in that sense Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we talked about um, selecting open source software, talked about SCA and prioritizing, and a little bit about yeah. um, artifact signing um, and policies. Do you want to quickly touch on um, uh, pipeline visibility or CACD security yeah. before we wrap up? I also For just sure. want to mention to everybody watching on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so if you just look up Endor Labs on, uh, on YouTube, uh, we have a lot of videos, there's a playlist of videos that shows breakdown demos that go deeper on each of these topics. A lot of them feature uh, Matt himself, who's right here with us. Um, so uh, just be aware of, uh, of that resource. Yeah, like what's cool about this tooling is you don't know what you don't know until you kind of find out. Like that's probably the best way I could describe it. So. This is the visibility portion. This was what we're talking about. Hey, what are the dependencies in my software? So we're able to identify all the different tools that you use across your pipelines. And what we can see here is, again, you can you know narrow this down. You can add your own tool through that pol same policy engine. We have a bunch out of the box, which is nice. But you can identify to say, you know, like Endor Labs is a dependency, right? We need Endor Labs to secure our software. That's a dependency. So what we could say is, okay, we're a GitHub Action Shop. Well, why are we using Circle CI and Jenkins and Travis in several different instances? And oh yeah, by the way, Travis had that issue a couple of years ago of a remote code execution vulnerability. Well, now I know the projects with which Travis is using. Why am I using five different SCA tools? There may be a good reason. Some tools have the capability to do different languages. Some tools don't. You know, it could be a good reason, but I need to know why. Like, are we spending money on all these different tools? Um, do we have infrastructure as code scanning? Why are only 13% of my pipelines covered with an SCA scanner, right? All these questions of what is my risk exposure? What can I see that, I can improve on what needs to be addressed right away, that kind of stuff. This is all part of the CICD visibility that, you know, this is the first step is the visibility. Then it's the statistics. Then it's like, okay, well, how can I actually more improve it? This is where we're going with it. But the first step is I need to know, I need to know about my CICD pipelines. And this is especially useful in huge enterprises where it's like, you could have some random, oh yeah, the data science team spun up Bitbucket because what two people liked Bitbucket at their last company. And it's like, well, God knows what's being stored in that, <laughs> in that repository. So being able to figure out, okay, what do I have? What do I don't have? This is a big first step for that visibility of securing these dependencies as well. Yeah. We were just talking about uh, GitHub actions as, um, as yeah. dependencies uh, the, the other day. And um, I was, like admittedly like struggling to understand you know how a github action works and then uh darren eventually like explained to me like it's it's essentially another application it's another app. application depends on right yeah. uh, and that yeah. application could have vulnerabilities and you your sca tool is not going to know it's there unless you specifically point it at it right mm -hmm. so you need to first just discover that it's there, like which GitHub Actions you're depending on. So you need to discover everything yeah. your code depends on and then secure it. Exactly right. And like, this is an example of that. It's like, hey, this GitHub Action, you know, Trivi uses a dependency called Semver and Semver is, has this vulnerability in it. And you can kind of see all these different dependencies that have all these different vulnerabilities in them that's what these that's what this is showing so these are github actions that have 
these dependencies within them itself that also your application depends on to run. So it's like that, um, what's that exhibit meme from Pit My Ride? Like, yo dog, I heard you love dependencies. Like these are dependencies of dependencies of dependencies of dependencies within your software that again, we wanna get the, get the visibility of it all. Anytime guys, anytime. Yeah. Uh, no, Matt, this is great. Uh, we're also going to be sending everybody the recording of this. And again, on our uh, YouTube channel, you can dig into any of these topics. And of course, there's also a free trial. So all of this is available yeah. in the free trial. Just go to our website, enderlabs.com. Um, and uh, you can sign up for for the free trial, uh, kick the tires. And um, my email is ron at endorlabs. Uh, ron at endor.ai. Uh, that's my email. And uh, if you have any questions, you're, you can reach out to me directly. Matt, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I will eventually catch you on, uh, on Helldivers. Finally. Thank goodness Finally. we need help. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Day. Appreciate it.